Tonight we'll be concluding the 26th chapter of Genesis. This will be our 42nd lesson as we progress through this book. We'll be going over the 26th chapter, verses 24 through 35. <clears throat> and the Lord appeared unto him, this is Isaac, the Lord appeared unto him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham, thy father. Fear not, for I am with thee and will bless thee and multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. And he builded an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there. And there Isaac's servants digged a well. Then Abimelech went unto him from Gerar and Ahuzeth, one of his friends, and Phicol, the chief captain of his army. And Isaac said unto them, Wherefore come ye to me, seeing ye hate me? and have sent me away from you. They said, We saw certainly that the Lord was with thee, and we said, Let there be now an oath betwixt us, even betwixt us and thee, and let us make a covenant with thee, that thou wilt do us no hurt, no hurt, as we have not touched thee, and as we have done good unto thee, nothing but good. We have done unto thee nothing but good, and have sent away thee, sent thee away in peace, and thou art now blessed of the Lord. And he made them a feast, and they did eat and drink. And they rose up betimes, or early, in the morning, and swear one to another. And Isaac sent them away, and they departed from him in peace. And it came to pass the next day that Isaac's servants came and told him concerning the well which they digged and said unto him, We have found water. And he called it Sheba. Therefore the name of the city is Beer Sheba unto this day. And Esau was forty years old when he took to wife Judith, the daughter of Barai, Barai the Hittite, and Bashamath, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, which were a grief of mind unto Isaac and to Rebekah. Mm -hmm. All you younger people that aren't married yet, marry someone that's not a grief of mind to your parents. <laughs> We've entitled this God, the Lord appears to Isaac, which is how it starts out. Now, at this point in the book of Genesis, God has focused his attention on special people, all the way up to this point. <clears throat> Following the fall of man and the beginning of the multiplication of the race, the record represents the Lord is focusing on the, follow, on the following seven people. We're accounting now for roughly 2,000 years, probably about 2,500 years of time. Abel, Cain, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Lot, and Isaac. All right. Of all the billions of people that lived up to that time. Uh -huh. right. We're learning something about God here. Amen. Of all the masses of people in the world during this time, only three women had direct dealings with God. Hagar, Sarah, and Rebekah. So during the first two millennia of time, we've got God dealing with about 
10 people. <laughs> and I tell you, brethren, something's happened since those days. Yeah, now that God has so much dealings with so many different people, something's happened that has changed the situation. <laughs> now, we know what it is, of course, in Christ Jesus. The sin of the world has been taken away, and God can have dealings now with a lot of people, not just, yeah, not just a handful of people. Now to this point in Scripture, to Genesis 26, through, through Genesis 26, whatever you may, may be said about the love of God, the mercy of God, the kindness of God, the grace of God, these traits have all been represented up to this point selectively. There's been certain people that enjoyed it, and most people didn't. If we're honest, we're going to have to just admit that's the way it is. It may conflict with some theology, but so what? Amen. Thus far, God is never represented as directing his love, kindness, and grace toward all men. Yeah, that's right. You're not fine up to this point. Yeah. I understand it's different now, but there's a reason why it's different. Yeah. God's nature hasn't changed. Amen. This is the real God here. Unless something was done outside the natural people, it'd still be just like it was here. Something's happened, see, in redemption. That's the kind of a good message we got to, to tell. Were it not for Christ Jesus, our situation today would be no different than mankind in Abraham's day. And it might even have been worse. Now, I want to be careful and deliberate at this point. It's not that God is not gracious and he's not merciful and full of goodness and kindness. He is all of that. But the focus of those traits upon any mortal or any period of time required the prospect of a savior. There had to be, there had to be somebody else enter into this scenario before those traits could be expressed toward humanity. Amen. And God's will is so deliberate that just the promise or the the, the anticipation of that Savior yeah. allowed him to have dealings with these That's people. right. Yeah. See, people are fond of saying this. Almost all church people say, God loves everybody and so forth. So forth. Give statements like this. But the, this is not a very, this is not precise enough. This is not precise enough. It's only because of Jesus Christ and his cross that God can have these universal dealings with humanity. And that has got to be made clear. People are, people are representing God in another way. They're saying it's God's nature to be inclined toward everybody. I'm saying his nature is not the issue here. The issue is what's righteous for him to do. And it was unrighteous for God to bestow his grace and mercy and love and kindness on humanity apart from Christ. Amen. It wasn't right. But it is now, praise yeah. God. <laughs> it is now. Yes. I have a question. You, right here on page two, during the first two millennia of time, God is recorded as having personal dealings with ten people and two of them were not conventional transactions, Cain and Hagar. This helps shape an accurate picture of the living God. He obviously does not view anyone in the same manner. So, to say if his view changed on man, would that make him a respecter of persons? He did say what now? If his view changed on man, because he oh, yes. man in the yeah, heart, would yes. that make him a respecter of persons? Yes, it would. Mm -hmm. That's the only way you could account for it. That's the only way you could account for it. he views men as they really are, and if he changed his view, then he would be That's right. making men something that they're not. And all these people that he had favorable dealings with, God initiated the contact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Every single one of them now. We're not in every single instance where God bestowed favor, Noah found grace, Abraham called, and so forth, God initiated the contact. The few that you're talking about, he, God used, i never seen it before, but he's used a bare minimum That's of right. people That's to get right. to work his purpose. That's right. No extra. Mm -hmm. 
It's actually still, if you can see, it's still that way. It still works with the remnant. That being said, now let's look at this text. The Lord appeared unto him the same night. That's upon his arrival to Bathsheba after Abimelech had said, Leave. You're mightier than we are. Leave, leave our area. That's just before this. So he did it, and upon leaving the area and arriving at Beersheba the same night, <laughs> after he got out of that Philistine citadel into Beersheba, the same night the Lord appeared to him. Now the, Lord, the text doesn't say it was a dream. I'm inclined to think he appeared in a dream because it was night, but that's, that's beside the point. The reason for these appearances of which this is one was to establish the certainty of things to come. See, that's why God appeared. God didn't appear to console Isaac because he had some trouble with the Philistines. <laughs> he appeared to him to confirm what he'd promised. There's no other way to establish them than to confirm what God's going to do. You can't, God doesn't establish people by stroking their head and patting their back. Yeah, right. Let's just be clear about this. This isn't how he does it. God points to himself and what he's doing and how that bears on the individual, and that's what brings consolation. Appearances of the Lord must be considered, all of them, from this one and any others, within the context of God's eternal purpose. The only reason for God appearing to anybody is because of what he's doing. That's what I want to establish. Now this eternal purpose was in place before the foundation of the world. This is a, Apostles taught us this. They didn't know this about this before. He saved us with a holy calling, not according to our own works but according to his own purpose and grace which is given us in Christ Jesus before the world began so that Amen. all of God's dealings with people was in view of this it isn't that God tried with Adam but it, it, it failed that project failed so we're going to come at it another way and he tried with Israel and that failed and come at it another way see some people think this is the case Oh, it's his eternal purpose. It was in mind. From God's point of view, these appearances were in anticipation of the coming Christ. So I wanted to take just a moment. I won't read all these. You can read them at your leisure. Of all the specified appearances of the Lord or visions of God or appearances of the risen Christ or appearances of angels or seeing things of another realm and order. And I, I think it's a, a thorough list. You might find, uh, overlook some, but where he appeared, the Lord appeared, where that, that language is used, to, to Abram and Isaac and Jacob. He appeared to Israel more than once, to Moses and Aaron, to Moses and Joshua, to Samuel, to David, to Solomon, to Micaiah, and to Amos. Categorically said the Lord appeared to him. Then both Ezekiel and Daniel had visions, quote, visions of God, unquote. Then the risen Christ, he made some appearances. Mary Magdalene, the women that came to the tomb, two on the road to Emmaus, the eleven, the disciples, the apostles, Saul of Tarsus, Cephas, Above 500 brethren at once, James and John on the Isle of Patmos. The exalted Christ made those appearances to these people. Then there were a few occasions in Scripture where angels, heavenly angels, appeared to men. They included Moses, Gideon, Samson's mother, Joseph, Zacharias, Jesus Christ when he prayed in Gethsemane, an angel appeared, Cornelius, Peter, and Paul. Then things of another order were seen, like a 
chariot of fire coming down from heaven, or Elisha going up into heaven. Or Ezekiel, he saw visions of things in heaven. Or on the day of Pentecost, cloven tongues of fire. <clears throat> well, I want to make some preliminary observations about these appearances. You notice how they begin to diminish with the commencement of the gospel. Interesting, isn't it? Some people would figure they'd pick up. But instead they begin to shut down. With the possible exception of the book of the Revelation, which was a vision, there were no appearances or likenesses of God himself as took place with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Israel, Moses, Aaron, Samuel, David, Solomon, and Micaiah. And that's from the book of Haggai through the end of Revelation. The promises given to the fathers were during these appearances. The promises given were always what God was going to do. I list them here. In all of them, he said things like, I will. I will make. I will bless. I will bless. I will make. I will give. I will make. I will make. See, there are all these appearances confirming what he's going to do. I will establish. I will give. I will bless. I will bless. I will be with thee. I will bless thee. I will give thee these countries. I will perform the oath. I will make thy seed multiply. I will make thy seed multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give you the land. I'll, gi I'll give it to you. See, so all of these, these, these happen during these appearances. All these appearances, what God was going yeah. to do. Now, I've taken time to list these to confirm their consistency that it was the same kind of thing. There were, none of these appearances were like novel at all. They all pertain to what God would do in the future. He always, they always were talking about the future all the time. Then there were promises delivered to the prophets. They were always what God would do. I list some of them, what he was going to do. Boiled down to a Savior in the New Covenant. Peter on the day of Pentecost, he summarized, uh, on the day of Pentecost in the temple, he summarized this when he said, all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold these days. He thought it was, yeah. was going to happen. Now at this point, we come into the distinction of the new covenant. <laughs> now everything doesn't revolve around appearances or angels, or visible interventions. Now everything revolves around a message. Yeah. Not a message of what shall be, but a message of what has been accomplished. These, these are new times we're living in now, brethren. These are different kind of times. Everything centers in a message of what's already been done. This is the gospel, which is referred to as the gospel of the grace of God, the gospel of God, the gospel of his son, the gospel of peace, glad tidings of good things, the gospel of your salvation, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious gospel of the blessed God. So all of this has to do with what has already taken place. In other words, we have a more sure word of prophecy. The message that we are preaching is something that's already been done. Amen. We are not preaching the message of what God will do. Well, you got to see this now. Because there are some people who want you sorely would like you to have a message of what God will do. Now, the message is what God has done. All the power is invested in that message. Amen. That message is the power of God and to salvation. It's not a promise of what he's going to do for those who believe. It's a promise of what he has done. See, it's all based on what has been done already. But what has, what has been done? Well, sin's been put away and reconciliation's been made. Satan's been destroyed. Principalities and powers have been plundered. Peace has been made. The law has been ended as a means of righteousness. 
Jesus has been exalted above all. Jesus is living to make intercession. Jesus, the great high priest who can be touched with the fiend of our infirmities. He's been given to the church as head over all things. He's presently the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. None of these things are revealed overtly. It was an appearance. It was a word that testified to this. The truth is contained in a message. In our day there has, by presentation human reasoning, been a corruption of the nature, effects, and intents of salvation. So that the gospel is viewed by the modern church as a creedal system rather than glad tidings of good things. Now, this is the way it is. I come out of a institution that this this was they were very strong on this. The result has been that the nominal church has been mired in the mud of carnality because the power which is in the gospel, the gospel, not in the gospel, the gospel is the power, has been withdrawn from the church. Oh, yes, it has. In fact, there's a theology, which I once was part of it. Theology says the gospel is for sinners and teaching is for saints. This is still being taught. You, you don't have to go too far from here to hear it. But this emphatically is not true. It's not the case. The gospel didn't stop being the power of God once you got in Christ. It's still the power Amen. from beginning to end. And your salvation is not done yet. Mm -hmm. The end of your objective of your salvation hasn't been realized yet. There's a salvation to be revealed mm -hmm. when Jesus comes, when our bodies will be transformed. Yeah. See, and if that message, if that message is withdrawn from the church. The church has no power. Amen. Now it can use all kind of programs. It can use recovery programs. It can use church planning techniques and soul winning techniques and create all kind of Christian schools and universities and seminaries and libraries. But it will never obtain power till the gospel's put back in. Amen. I've said that because that's a whole lot different than back in the days we're reading right now. That's why the Lord doesn't appear to people. You say, is it impossible for the Lord to appear? I would not say it was impossible, no, I would not. I would say it's not the standard mode of operation. Somewhere the person's got to believe the gospel. At some point you have to hear and believe the gospel by which you shall be saved if you keep it in memory yes, amen. as the scripture states amen. so the Lord appears unto Isaac because of the primitive nature of the times now see he appears to Isaac and he says I am the God of Abraham thy father fear not for I am with thee I will bless thee and multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. Again, these revelations are about what God is, is doing, not what man is doing. During the times prior to scriptures, God would, re would repeat his promises again and again. Just as this promise is right here. This is, this is several times in Genesis stated to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They've got to perceive that God's Dealing with them revolve around his this commitment that he's made Amen. to them. See, men have their this tendency to think about what what they think is the main thing. They, their lives kind of center in themselves. Uh -huh. God allows for you to seek your your legitimate interests, but your life can't revolve around your interests at all. What the Lord says to Isaac has to do with his purpose, not merely the well-being of Isaac. Uh, Isaac, <clears throat> just so you'll not forget this, I'm the God of Abraham thy father. Just, just so we get off on the right foot here. 
Now this is the first time the expression God of Abraham or God of the your father Abraham appears in scripture. It's, first, it's, a, it's found after this a lot of times. God is the God of Abraham. But this is the first time this appears. It would be inappropriate to say this before. But it is very appropriate to say it afterward. It is true that later God will be known as the God of Isaac. But that is at the at this point it'd be inappropriate to say that. That was generally said after the people passed away. Then they said that. The foundational point of God's promises is not the individual or the individuals to whom they're addressed. See, he makes quite clear. It's, he's he's the God's the point. God is always the point. Amen. Not man. It's what he is doing, his purpose, it is the point. <coughs> I'm, I'm with thee, Isaac. Mm -hmm. See, the reason he was with Isaac, because Isaac was Abraham's heir. Mm -hmm. Amen. That's why God was with Isaac. Mm -hmm. God wasn't with Isaac because Isaac was Isaac, because mm -hmm. Abraham was Abraham. Amen. I'm the God of thy father, Abraham. And I'm, the blessing I gave him now is coming. It's not, a, it's not your blessing. It's Abraham's blessing. Amen. He's teaching us to think now. Yes, he right. teaches us how to think. When you get something from God, it's got to go through somebody other than you. Yes, right. God of Abraham, I'm with thee. I'm going to bless you because of him. Now the reason, don't fear, he said, don't fear. Don't be afraid. Well, it must have been a fearful thing to be faced with the appearance of the Lord. I mean, I, I can't imagine a person being casual during an occasion like that. The divine order was Abraham and his seed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thus we read, now to Abraham and his seed. Where the promise is made. See, to Abraham and his seed. Where the promise is made. That's how godly Abraham was. Mm -hmm. that's, how much, that's how much faith Abraham had. As is evident from the text, those in Christ are also Abraham's seed. And that's actually stated in the third chapter of Galatians. If you be Abraham's, then if you be Christ, then you're Abraham's seed yeah. uh -huh. and heirs according to the promise. See, you can't take credit for your salvation. It goes back first to Christ, and then after you get through that, it goes back to Abraham. So, so you see, you, can't, <laughs> you, have, you, are, you, have, you have benefited from it, but it's not because of you. So a gospel, it says, Jesus was thinking about you when he died. Oh, there was an old gospel song, Southern gospel song written about that. Oh, it made people cry. People cry. I think maybe I did too when I first heard it. But Jesus was thinking he had me on his mind when he was dying. Well, no, nothing could be further from the truth. He did not have you on his mind when he was dying. We know this is the case because he turned his disciples over to God before he went to his death. He wasn't going to, he wasn't going to be thinking about his disciples. He was going to be thinking about laying down his life and taking it up again. He was going to take everything he had to do that. See, when you heard this kind of stuff, this sentimental, it distorts your thinking. did comment on that? He said, for the joy that was set before him. Amen. Now, I will, I will bless thee. To be blessed meant that Isaac would prosper in whatever he did. This is what it meant for Isaac. Whatever he put his hand to, it, he'd prosper. I'll bless thee. Because you're Abraham's seed. Yeah, I told Abraham, I'm going to bless you and your seed. And I'll multiply you. At that, that time, he had two boys. In fact, as far as we know, that's all he ever did have. But I'm going to multiply you now. Because you're Abraham's seed, I'm going to multiply you. That's the same thing God said to Abraham. He said that same thing. Now he passed the promise down to Isaac Amen. through Abraham. Now, so why, why is this continually promised by God, a multiplicity of seed? Isn't one enough? Or is, is it like a 
two or three or seven or seventy enough? I mean, why, why this multiplication? Well, there's a reason why, at least, at least two reasons I can think of. One is that they had to have enough offspring to fill the promised land when they got there. You can't occupy Canaan, let me tell you, with 70 people. You just have a bunch of slaves is all you have, see? When God told Moses he's going to give him the land, there wasn't enough of them. There was only 2, 3 million at the time. 601,000 footmen 20, between 20 and 50 years of age. But that wasn't enough to fill the land. So here's what God said. And the Lord thy God will put out those nations before thee by little and little. Thou mayest not consume them at once. I could, I could clean out the land with just this number of people. I mean, I have no trouble doing that. But if I did that, the beasts of the field would increase upon thee. Then you'd have vast areas of unoccupied territory, and the beasts would come in, and they'd, they'd consume you. So they, were, they had to have enough people to fill the land. I don't think some people have really given a due thought to this. Yeah, yeah. I think of the few. God's able to save with many or few. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to <laughs> occupying territory, that's, that's a little bit different than just defeating. Come to occupy territory. See, if we were successful in our fairer city, if we were successful, we drove the sodomites out. Quite an aggressive, uh, that'd be quite an aggressive challenge. We haven't even been able to get the two blocks surrounding our house purged. That'd be pretty aggressive. But if you didn't fill up the place that they occupied, you'd really done nothing. Hmm? So let's say we overthrew the evolutionists and the sodomites and all this. We cast our doctrine down to the ground. They weren't troubling us anymore, but we didn't occupy the place they did. We didn't fill up with truth the place that had been filled up with the lie. What really had we done? I don't think a due consideration has been given uh, to that fact. So that's one, the land occupy the land. Then the second reason is in anticipation of the Regrafting in of the Jews before the end of time. Paul said, Romans 11, 23, they also, the Jews, they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God's able to graft them in again. Of course, if they'd been totally cut off, God wouldn't be, the God who totally cut them off. Well, and we shouldn't have to comment on that. If thou wert cut out of a wire of the olive tree which is wild by nature would graft contrary to nature into a good olive tree how much more shall these which be the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree for I would not brethren that ye should be ignorant of this mystery lest ye be wise in your own conceits that blindness in part blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in so all Israel shall be saved as it is written, the deliverer, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, shall turn away in godliness from Jacob. So in anticipation of that promise, I'm going to multiply your seed. Amen. You see? <laughs> Lord always works in view of his purpose. But I'm going to do this, Isaac, for my servant Abraham's sake. Now our first exposure to this kind of reasoning was when Abraham uh, pled with God in Genesis 18 about the destruction of the righteous with the wicked when he divulged what he's going to do with Sodom. And Abraham said, will you destroy the righteous with the wicked? He said, will you, will you spare the city for 50? If there's 50 righteous for their sake, that's what you want to want to minister. For their sake, will you? And God said, yes, I'll, I'll spare it for 50. And he, he, he narrowed it down, got down to 10. And God said, for the, for the sake of the 10, yeah. for, for their sake, I'll spare the city. Well, you know, this should teach you how to pray. 
So you're concerned for the nation, are you? You should be. Mm -hmm. yeah. See, but we're praying for the conversion. Well, see, there isn't, I don't read in Scripture where anybody ever prayed for the conversion of sinners. Now, this is just, this is just me. I'm not about to buy in this thinking on anybody else, but this is just, I have a great respect for God's Word. And if God didn't say it, I'm not about to say it. Amen. Not knowingly, anyway. How about the remnant? How about praying for the remnant? Amen. Yet a remnant shall be saved. A remnant. Now this is a divine trait. God does something because of somebody else. Maybe the person's undeserving, but he did it for somebody else. Yeah. Well, even in the beginning, God cursed the ground for Adam's sake. See, say Adam's the reason why you're having trouble with the, the weeds and all that. That's right. Hey, curse the ground for Adam's sake. That's what he said. And Lot was delivered from Sodom because, as the scripture says, God remembered Abraham. Yeah. Getting ready to destroy the city. Genesis 19, 29, he remembered Abraham. Didn't say he remembered Lot, he remembered Abraham. Laban said he was blessed for the sake of Jacob. He said, I can see it. I can see God blessed me because of you. Potiphar's household was blessed for the sake of Joseph. Pharaoh and the Egyptians were judged for the sake of Israel. Exodus 18.8. David sought to bless anyone left in the house of Saul for Jonathan's sake. Mm -hmm. yeah. What a thought. God did not divide the kingdom. Solomon had, had left the Lord. But God did not divide the kingdom because of Solomon's sin until after he died, saying he'd do so for David's sake. In the division of Israel, one tribe was especially kept, quote, for David's sake. God made Solomon to be prince all the days of his life for David, <laughs> my servant's sake. And that's why Solomon was able to reign, even though he was a terrible man. For David's sake, whom I chose because he kept my commandments and statutes. Solomon, you didn't, but my servant David, I'm sparing you for David's sake. God set a moral, spiritual lamp in Jerusalem for David's sake. Well, this is good stuff here, isn't it? Amen. <laughs> God would not destroy Judah for his David, his servant's sake, to give him all way of the light and to his children. God defended the city of Jerusalem for his servant David's sake. God added 15 years to the life of Hezekiah and defended the city of Jerusalem, he said, for David's sake. Amen. Knowing the nature of God, the psalmist prayed, for thy servant David's sake, turn not away the face of thine anointed. <laughs> God said he preserved the nation of Israel for Jacob, my servant's sake. Jesus said God would shorten the days of great tribulation for the elect's sake. The Savior told God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Paul talked about his own sufferings that had been left behind for us and their experience and endured for his body's sake. See, this, is, this is a principle. God operates on this principle. Just, Yeah, that's right. And this, this yeah. is how he served the generation well, is that he sought the Lord first. Amen. He blessed the Lord, and then the rest of them were affected for David's Amen. sake. Amen. Now, I don't know how far a person could take this, but I think it's possible for you to live in such a manner so devoted to God that after you're gone, it might go well for some people. There might be some mercy extended yeah. to some people for your sake. Yeah. Amen. I like to think about that at any rate. Yeah. So I would say that option's on the table. Yeah. We've got examples of it. Amen. And clear distinctions from the law, which constituted the words of the covenant. See, this kind of thing wasn't built in the law. For so-and-so's sake, there, that kind of language was not in any part of the old covenant. 
It was you, you did it, and you nothing went well with you for anybody else's sake. Yeah. You're going to be accepted. You had to keep the law. That was the covenant. Mm -hmm. The old covenant was based on the individual carrying out the words to the finest distinction. The Ten Commandments are called the words of the covenant. Thou shalt, thou shalt, thou shalt, thou shalt not, thou shalt. Did you, the covenant was when you agreed to, to do what that said. That agreement was expressed in Exodus 19.8. I'm showing now the difference between God's promises and how he dealt with under the old covenant. All the people answered together. All the people answered together. Well, see, this couldn't be done in most church most church gatherings. You couldn't get the people all to answer together because <laughs> they'd be dispersed throughout the building. They all answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. That was the covenant. The covenant was what God said we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people to the Lord. Then he took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. All right, you agreed. You agreed you'd keep all the words of this book. God made, the agreement God made was this with the people, All the commandments which I command thee this day shalt ye observe to do, that ye may live and multiply and go and possess the land which the Lord swore unto your fathers. Mm -hmm. Again, he said, Ye shall therefore keep my statutes, my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. I am the Lord. Mm -hmm. The law summarized them, the covenant, when thou, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy, and with all thy might. That's the old covenant. It was different than the covenant he made with Abraham. Yeah, yeah, that's right. The covenant God made with Abraham was more like the new covenant. Yeah, that's right. yep. In fact, the message preached to him is called the gospel was preached first to Abraham. So it was the covenant that you're living under was first made with Abraham. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Paul categorically says that in Galatians. Yes. Mm -hmm. It was in a, in a summary form. Mm -hmm. But it was made with, it was a different basis. It was a right. different kind of covenant. Yes. It was an I will covenant, not you shall covenant. It was an I will, God, I will covenant. So the new covenant is based on faith, mm -hmm. believing what God said, yeah. but particularly about his son. I know that a lot of people have, they have not seen this, but... That's why we're here. Help people to yeah. help people to see this. Amen. I will be with thee. I will bless thee. See, I'm sorry. It was a different. Mm -hmm. It was a different basis yeah, than right. what Moses administered. It was a different kind of. It was a court. We can learn from this. This is the kind of covenant we've got. Yeah. Except for Abraham's sake, it's for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, Isaac responded. He built an altar there. Words of Bernani, build an altar there. <laughs> I like it. Now that's the sixth time in Scripture that an altar has been built. Noah built one when he exited from the ark. Abraham, after arriving in Canaan and hearing the promise of God to give the land to his seed, he built an altar. Then after receiving the promise of God that the land would be given to him and his seed, he built, moved to Bethel and built an altar. Abraham, after he was told to walk through the land, he, he went to a high spot where he's going to start. He built an altar then. Abraham, when he arrived at the mountain where God told him to offer Isaac, he built an altar there. And Isaac, after receiving this promise, he built an altar. <laughs> now observe that God, the record doesn't say God commanded any of these altars to be built. These were men of faith now. Abraham and Isaac, Noah, Abraham and Isaac, they kind of knew what to do. Built an altar to God. It was their response of thankfulness and recognition of God, and this sort of worship of God that was God-centered. 
And he called on the name of the Lord. Well, what does it mean to call on the name of the Lord? Is that, if you've ever tried to explain it, it's not so easy, is it? What's it mean to call on the name of the Lord? Well, as used here, it means to express a complete reliance on the Lord. See, a lot of people pray that aren't really fully relying on the Lord. They're not calling on the name of the Lord. They're, it's more like help me type thing. Calling on the name of the Lord, no one did that until Seth's son Enos was born. which was 230 years after Adam fell. It was 230 years before anybody started calling on the name of the Lord. That's what sin did to our race. That's what kind of separation existed between our race and God. Then they begin to call on the name of the Lord. And what does that mean? Well... <coughs> Calling the name of the Lord is a reflection of a heart that trusts in the Lord. So far as they're concerned, God's the only person. <laughs> That's really kind of how they look at it. God's all in all is how we would say. When Ananias told Saul of Tarsus to ask him, what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized. How often do you hear anyone say that these days? Look, what are you, what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized. They say, well, yeah, I don't think you should press them. Well, the devil presses people. Why shouldn't you? Why shouldn't the people of God put some pressure on? Why tell us that rise and be baptized? Calling on the name of the Lord. He mentioned that. Now, people that emphasize baptism, they will never, never mention calling on the name of the Lord. You just check it out and see if I'm not telling you the truth. They'll never mention that. Calling on the name of the Lord. There's some, this, is, this equates to what Paul called faith in the operation of God. Yes. That, that will kind of be the yeah. parallel. Amen. This is good to teach our children and people under us that we teach, to teach them this, that when you obey the Lord, call on his name at that time. You're, you're tender. It couldn't be a better time. Yeah, right. You're tender and God, God will break through to you. Call the name of the Lord. And Paul wrote, this is like something God's people do. The Corinthians, he wrote, 1 Corinthians 1, 2, to the church of God, which is a current to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all and in every place, call on the name of the Lord. So this is something that, uh, <laughs> this doesn't mean they have a worship service. This is what that means. This is more related to prayer than to singing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and to obedience, yeah. this sort of thing. And the salvation of God, total and consistent reliance upon the Lord is depicted in calling upon the name of the Lord. See, it's just a complete, unreserved reliance upon the Lord. And he, he pitched his tent there. I'm going to stay here a while. I'm going to stay here. I'm going to pitch my tent here. Here where I got this promise, here where I built this altar, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay here for a while. He chose to live where there was a continual reminder, see? He wanted to live where the surroundings reminded him of what God had said. The place of blessing was his chosen habitation. Like David, he said, oh, he says, I want to dwell in your courts. See, he wanted to... <laughs> He wanted to be where he was most conscious of God and where he could more readily remember the things of the Lord. See, there are places you can get where it's hard to remember God and the promises of God. There are places like that. And sometimes you, you may not have a choice about being in places like that, but now that's where fighting the good fight of faith comes in, see? That's in those places you build an altar. And you call on the name of the Lord. And where you've got control of the situation, you just don't, don't pitch your tent where it's hard to re recall the things of God. 
parallels believers setting their affection on things above, not on things on the earth. And on top of that, his servants dig the well. They got another well going here. Of course, you're going to live here. You've got to have some water. You've got to have sustenance. So they built. Yeah. They built a well. Now we're being introduced to like proper responses to God. God bless no one who builds an altar. God blesses Abraham, builds an altar. Calls in, God blesses Isaac, builds an altar. Proper responses to God. See, under the administration of Babylon the Great. Proper responses to God have become virtually unknown. People are like, what do I do? What do I do now? They don't know how to respond to a blessing. Yeah. When God has dealt favorably with us, favorably with us, it's necessary that we offer ourselves to him. Yes, amen. A living sacrifice. Yes, See, amen. we ourselves are on this altar. We, you don't build an altar that the Lamb of God sacrificed on. That's that's not yours to build. Right. You build an altar, your altar, your sacrifice Amen. on. Amen. Living sacrifice. Yeah. Well, yes. It becomes a confirmation that that you actually got the point, or you know, you got the benefit from having this appearance from God. That's right. Yeah. Amen. Which glorifies God. Yeah. So. Well, I built the altars, called on the Lord. They got this well flowing. And here comes Abimelech, and he's got a who's this with him, captain of the army. It's an impressive entourage, huh? Here comes the king, a friend, it says, was, if we understand it, was a close friend, confidant, an advisor of some sort, and a military leader. And he's bolstering his presence, because this is the man of flesh to make a make a an impressive appearance. This this is like flesh. <clears throat> now the king was he's going to suggest something here that on which these three men are apparently agreed. They kind of agreed on this mission. They don't know what we know that. If the wicked agree, that, that, that doesn't give any weight to what they're going to do yeah. at all. As Proverbs 11, 21 says, Though hand join in hand, the wicked shall not be unpunished. Just because there's a consensus, because all the people say yes, <laughs> that doesn't mean that the thing's going to work at all. Well, Isaac, how you, what are you going to do now? You've had a, kind of a run-in before with Abimelech, and here he comes. So Isaac now, he's he's straightforward. See, God's with him. He's not afraid of man. He, he, in fact, God is called the fear of Isaac. That's what Laban called him, the fear of Isaac. He feared God. He says, Wherefore come ye to me, seeing ye hate me? <laughs> hey, hey, hey. you tell me, go away. Now you come to me and you want to make a covenant of some kind. How come you're covenant? You hate me. Now, sometimes the wicked have to be told stuff like this. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. They just have to be told. You just got to come on and tell them, I, I know you hate me. Mm -hmm. So why are you here? You kicked me off your land. Told me to leave, and I did. Now here you are. Here you are again. Yeah. Yeah, the wicked are like that. They crop up. Mm -hmm. Many of them, they don't. He admitted there's hostility here. You hate me. Bimelech himself admitted that if he hadn't published an edict, whoever touches Isaac or his wife would be killed, that some of the some of those Philistines would have ravaged Rebekah. Yeah. 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 He weren't as kind people as they let on. Mm -hmm. And Abimelech, he'd, uh, the, he'd told him to leave, and the Philistines had stopped up the wells of his father and contended for two wells he dug and took them over. So it, it was clear they hated him. They didn't need any more proof of their hatred. And we all learn from this that the hostility of the world is created by divine affiliation. 
is because people are connected with God, that's why the world's against them. It's not just because of you. That you the devil will trick you into thinking this. Thinking this way, but it's no, no it's because of your association with the world, with the Lord. As soon as a person or a group of persons is solidly aligned with the Lord, the Abimelechs start to show up. Yeah, that's right. They want to make some kind of agreement. Because they, to them, difference means war. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, driven to its logical conclusion, it does to us too. Yeah. I mean, now let's be clear about this. We're willing to fight to keep the faith. We're not going to sit down on our leaves because the enemy comes and threatens us. We're going to rise up and fight. Yeah. Now, our weapons of our warfare are not carnal. We're not going to fight with carnal weapons. We got the kind of weapons we can make people think different. Yeah. Yes. That's what he said. Right. Weapons of our warfare are mighty through God, the casting down of strongholds. He wasn't talking about strongholds in you. Talk about strongholds in Corinth that Paul said, I'm going to cast it in. I'm going to come and fight against you with the word of my mouth. Uh -huh. you know, the Christian community hasn't uh, exploited this. If you got to be sure you're able to do this. Say, now I'm, I'm about to throw down this argument. Uh -huh. We're not going to like sit and let you keep talking this way. There's an imagination has got a hold of you. And we've been joined to the Lord, who's the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and we're gonna we've got weapons that are calculated to throw down these erroneous ways of thinking. Yeah. We are witnesses in your debate about the non instrumental music. <laughs> uh, it was, uh, at the end of that, that that tower was thrown down. Yeah. That, that that idea, that way of thinking was thrown down. Yeah, they didn't have any other debate on that issue. No. Remember James said to confirm there's hostility between the world and God. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is, not can be, uh -huh. is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be or wants to be or desires to be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. So see, there's a hostility between the Philistines and the offspring of... <laughs> Just why? Because God chose Abraham and his seed. That's what created this hostility. No. I know you hate me. Jesus brought this fact home to his disciples when he said, now if the world would hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. See, I said that the reason is because of divine affiliation. There, there it is spelled out. He said that the world hates him without a reason. Without, right. without, right. without a cause. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Now, sometimes conflict is, is the result of you loving the people. <laughs> That's actually what produces yeah. the conflict. Yeah, as soon as God makes himself known to a person or as soon as you see the day star rises in your heart, as soon as you start to see things clearly, some people you thought were for you, you find out they're against you. That actually happens. But see, Abimelech had to admit they were kind of, they were kind of fearful of Isaac. We saw certainly the Lord is with you. Hey, we can see it. Every place you went, you prospered. Every time you dug a well, you found water. Planted a field, you got a hundredfold. Yeah. And we can tell. <laughs> but notice there's something Abimelech didn't say. Abimelech didn't say, we want to follow you. Tell us about your God. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't say that. Mm -hmm. Why not? Hostility. Yeah. Cardinal minds enmity against God. That's why. Well, that you'll find some people that would like to be your friend, but they are not about to ask you to have your God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We say no. 
The rich young ruler, he wanted to obtain eternal life, but not if it meant to sell his all his, give his possessions away. Not if it meant, if it meant to get rid of his riches, eh, he didn't want to follow Jesus under those kind of conditions. Another man said, I'd, uh, I'd like to follow you, but I got a few duties to fulfill at home first. So let me go home now. He says, let the dead bury their dead. Come down and follow me. See, there are some people say, we'd like to come to your church, but <laughs> it's, it's so long. I don't think I'm ready for something like that. Oh, yes, and I, we hear this. We heard it just, just a few days ago. Someone's sitting right here in this room. Say, we're with you. We like what you say. We want what you say, but uh, I, just, I just don't think I'm ready for that extensive involvement. Say, so, well, here's how it is, brother compromiser. We are serious about serving God. We serve him when we're on the job, when we're in the assembly, when we're at home or wherever. Amen. And we don't want to have fellowship with someone who doesn't. That's the way it is. If you're willing, if you're willing to live by that, we extend you the right hand of fellowship. And if you're not, there's a bunch of other churches around here that you'd feel a little bit more at home in. You go there. There's no virtue in someone saying, I believe in God and I read the Bible every day. But if he's not building an altar to God and calling on the name of the Lord, and all of that's just wasted energy. And beside that, Abimelech, he exaggerated things. My goodness, he exaggerated things. Listen to what he said. Let there be now an oath betwixt us, even betwixt us and thee, and let us make a covenant with thee that thou wilt do us no harm, as we have not touched thee, and as we have done unto thee nothing but good, and have sent thee away in peace. Is that right, Abimelech? You cause a lot of heartache for Isaac and Rebekah, and Isaac's servants fussing over the wells, your people. See, he exaggerated. <laughs> When the world, they'll say to you, well, I haven't done anything to you. Well, they're overstating the case. Yeah. They don't realize what they're saying. Good. Yes? If this was true, like King of Imlech said, then how would Isaac possibly get the idea that they hated him? That's right. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I suppose the one said, well, Abimelech didn't know that his members of his nation were contending about the well. Well, they, that doesn't excuse him. He was a king. He should have known. Oh. A king should know what's going on in his empire. Yes. We know that thou art blessed. Thou art now blessed to the Lord. We can we can see it. We can see the Lord's with you. Now it's Abimelech is kind of suggesting that even though he sent Isaac away, God is still blessing him anyway. It's kind of it's kind of a veiled admission. He kind of flavored it up a little bit so it didn't sound as direct as it really was. But here he, he sent him away and Isaac prospers. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> now there's some people that have sent us away. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now some of us anyway, they sent us away. I've been sent away a couple places. Been sent away. It aggravates them that we're prospering. Yeah. And I say, let them be aggravated. Yeah. When you're rejected by the intelligentsia of the land, just build your altar, yeah. call on the name of the Lord, enjoy the Lord's prosperity, and stick it right under their nose. Just to show you got no reason to hate me just because I'm doing better than you're doing. I got peace and you don't. You fold up when trials happen, I don't. Your difficulties drive you to weep, drives us to pray. We're not ashamed of this. Unbelievers do not have a sound view of doing good. Otherwise, Abimelech would have said, I would like to have the blessing of the Lord too. Could you tell me some more about the God of Abraham? He didn't say that, see? 
Some people are willing to have a hand, get a handout from you. They don't mind that. They don't mind you digging dig down your pocket and, and giving them some things. They don't mind that, but it's just, they just don't want to follow your God. But Isaac, he's a generous man. He's a peacemaker. See, Isaac was a peacemaker. Yeah. See, so he makes him a feast. Made him a feast. Because yes. he was peaceable. He didn't make him a feast because he deserved one. He was a peaceable man. Mm -hmm. Made a feast. He entered a banquet. A, a lavish. Mm -hmm. Some people never have made a feast for anybody. They're, they're, hot, they're what I call hot dog people, you know. Uh -huh. They just have a bare, bare minimum. They never really know what it's like to prepare a feast. Yeah. Uh -huh. But now if you're going to follow God, you've got to get accustomed to this feasting. Yeah, Salvation is likened to a feast, uh -huh. not to a snack. Okay. <laughs> Salvation is not likened to a, like a McDonald's. Yeah. It's not like that. Uh -huh. It's a feast. Feast, tell the prophet Isaiah. In this mountain shall the Lord of hosts shall make unto all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wines and le wines on the lees and aged wine. That's the best meats and the best wines. Feast. Again, he cried out, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. He that hath no money, come ye and buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money, without price. Then he ends up by saying, let your soul delight itself in fatness. Feast. Salvation is a feast. Jesus referred to the provisions of salvation to a great supper that a man prepared. He likened salvation to God preparing a marriage supper for his son and served at his wedding. Great supper. Unfortunately, many people view life in Christ as a life of prohibition and you can't do this and you can't do that. They don't think of salvation as a feast. Yeah. Feast of great bounty. David? Yes. Uh, as you're talking about this, I see a salvation this feast as preparing us for the great feast of salvation. Yeah, that's right. Amen. 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 The point is here that if you refuse God's abundance, you can't have anything. This is a hard scene, and I'll be right up front with you. God won't let you have part. There's no such thing as a, a certain part of Christ you can have, but, you, but not all of them. Or you can have a kind of a portion of salvation, but not all of it. No, you, you either take all of what God offers, or you can't have anything. Why is it that way? Because when you come to Christ, your appetite may be small at first. So you can't take advantage of the abundance. But salvation is calculated to let you grow, so pretty soon you can have, you can be sampling all of the yeah, amen. all of the various foods on the table. You can that's what salvation is like. But I do not believe a lot of people know this. They 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 insist on believing that you can have a sample of Jesus or a sample of salvation or a little bit of Jesus or a little bit of salvation and that will suffice. No, let me be clear about this. No, it will not suffice. Yeah. Amen. Christ is not divided. Yeah. Amen. And if you could just have a portion of him, he'd be divided. Table of the Lord and the table of demons. That's right. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, one <laughs> only one table. Yeah. And if you have, if a person thinks they can subsist on beggarly supplies, they, you can't. Yeah. You can't remain faithful to the Lord and pleasing to the Lord while you're while you're nibbling. Yeah. Amen. It won't work. Yes. Yeah, I was imagining Jesus healed the the man's eyes when. The first time he touched him, he could only see his yeah, men walking yeah. as trees. But he didn't leave him like that. He That's made right. sure he was completely whole. That's right. It wasn't good enough just to be able to see men as trees. Amen. Yeah. Everybody can see this, can't they? Mm -hmm. Can't you? Amen. It, it radically changes how you view things, but this is the way God is. And when you realize how much he's given, then that's what kind of... Arrest your attention. He hasn't supplied a minuscule salvation at all. It's an abundant salvation. 
Yes. Whenever someone partakes small in the beginning with a desire for more, that's when salvation increases that des desire that's right. and ability. That's right. But mm -hmm. when someone partakes meagerly because of a disinterest or a dissatisfaction, mm -hmm. that's when the Lord causes it to almost inoculate them that's right. against the truth and they become hardened against that's it. That's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. Well, I'm great, grateful that people see this, that you see this. So a lot of people never have seen this. I know they haven't because if they had seen it, they would be digging into these things and getting as much as they could. Amen. Whoever set a sparse table, they'd quit sitting at it. That's right. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Yes, they shall be filled. filled. Amen. Now, this wouldn't be possible if there wasn't an abundance, would it? Well, I came to pass the same day. Isaac sent him away. After he gave him a feast and sent him away. Uh, it's interesting that Abimelech, when he sent Isaac away, he didn't make Isaac a feast and send him away. Yeah, that's right. Amen. But Isaac made Abimelech a feast and sent him away. Yeah. So when the people that kind of are your enemies and you even detect you, give them a lot to think about, then send them away. Yeah, right. give them a lot to think about, then send them away. Amen. Other servants came the same day. We found water. We... <laughs> We found, every time they dug, they found water. Yeah, we found water, same day, the same, the same day. Yeah. Found water. See, God had said, sojourn in this land, I'll be with thee and bless, bless thee. I'll bless thee in this land. Here he did, and he blessed me. Here's a well, dug a well. Now, that wasn't like Cain. You remember when God talked to Cain? He said, uh, when thou tillest the ground, it shall henceforth not yield unto thee her strength. The land won't respond to you, Cain. You can plant, you can dig, whatever you do, though. But look at Isaac there. He planted, land responded. He dug a well, land responded. You can expect this now. If you are in Christ and you're seeking him with your old heart, dig a well. You'll find out you'll find water. Yes, amen. Well, I think, you, I think many of you have already experienced this. Yeah. Maybe there's some text of scripture you don't really feel too comfortable yet in it, but you, you dig down, you say to the brethren, I found water here. Amen. <laughs> Same day, we found water. Look at the tenacity of Isaac and his servants. This whole visit probably kind of aggravated Isaac. We didn't stop the progress. Didn't stop the progress. You can't let aggravation stop the progress. Yes. Amen. Keep digging, brethren. Keep digging. <coughs> yes? You know, it, it can be a great help in uh, studying something that you're unfamiliar with is to read the glossary first before you get into the real material. <laughs> Amen. And accounts like this are kind of like a glossary. That's that right. give you an orientation into, That's right. into what God is doing. So... If you're just uh, the world couldn't be just be introduced to Jesus first. Mm -hmm. See that what the gospel is is so profound. What God is doing, the eternal purpose. So that he had he had to start introducing it way back when Adam and Eve first sinned, and he slay a, a an innocent animal to cover. It. Yeah, mm -hmm. their covering wasn't, and ever since then. The Lord has been writing a glossary to Amen. salvation Amen. in all these events, so that you can. He's he's introducing. He's the, the works of men don't need an introduction because they're not that deep. Amen. But the, the works of the Lord do. But you know, the law didn't have a forerunner. Jesus yeah, that's said. right. Amen. Now, at the end of this lesson, we want to write a list out the first through this chapter. I've listed out 272 firsts, which is this glossary. <laughs> and I think you'll find that yeah. almost every kind of scenario has been introduced uh -huh. yeah. or will be. Yeah. yeah. Amen. Well, he called the name of the well Sheba. Likes to go ladies tell us we're not quite really sure what this word means. Most seem to concur that oath is what it means. Some say seven is what it means. 
Smith's Bible Dictionary says abundance is what it means. So they, when people disagree with what it means, that just means there's no one knows. <laughs> the language kind of dries up. John Calvin said the Hebrew word here is ambiguous. We just can't. But if it does mean oath, that is what it means. I think it's God's oath, not Isaac's oath. Not Isaac's oath. The name of the city is Beersheba unto this day. Beersheba is the southmost city in the southmost part of Canaan. I have a map there that shows it to you. Now Beersheba was significant to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the nation of Israel, but Beersheba is not mentioned from Obadiah through Revelation. Interesting, isn't it? From Joshua through Malachi, Jerusalem is mentioned 667 times. From Matthew through Revelation, the city of Jerusalem is mentioned 44 times, 70, uh, 144, 144 times, 77 in the Gospels, 60 in the book of Acts, 14 from Romans through Revelation. Four times it's used in a spiritual sense. Jerusalem, which is above, New Jerusalem, Heavenly Jerusalem. Now, there's something to note here. None of the references to the city of Jerusalem in Acts through Revelation are doctrinal in nature. The closest you come is when he said Jerusalem, which is above, is the mother of us all. That's the closest you come to it. This is because there's been a change of covenants. The center of divine activity is not on earth. It was back then. That was the center of, of what God was doing was on earth. So now Beersheba becomes important on earth, Jerusalem becomes important, see, Canaan becomes important. But now, now in Christ, the earth is not the locus of the activity. The single reference to the saints reigning on earth, Revelation 5.10, all the books been written on that, you'd think there'd be text all over with that. But that's one of the places mentioned, is speaks of the, the saints being given charge of the new earth, the new heavens. All of this, however, was in place prior to the exaltation of Christ. So cities like Beersheba, Jerusalem, city of David, Samaria, Babylon, that's why those are mentioned. It was a different kind of time. It wasn't a different kind of God. It was a different kind of time. So he had to imprint. This is like history is like clay, and these events are like God's thumbprint in the clay. So that when you study these events, you get a kind of an idea about what God is like and what he's doing, see? But that's not how the new covenant is. <laughs> it's a different kind of covenant. Yeah, the fatal flaw in a lot of es eschatology, that study of last things, in our time is there's too much stress placed on worldly cities and worldly yeah, kings right. and worldly occurrences. So unlike the promises delivered into, unto Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the promises of God now are in Christ. Yeah, right. And Christ is in heaven. <laughs> Rather than the earth being a base, basis of uh, an environment of operation, we are told that the present heavens and earth are going to pass away. So just, just to clarify, I think, that's why... This isn't the real arena yeah. of divine operation. Amen. Things are going on here. God's doing things here, but it's in prospect of the world passing away. Right. With Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they dealt with him on land with the prospect that it was going to remain here until his purpose for the land was fulfilled. According to the... Uh, now he mentioned East next. We have a closing verse that mentions something about Esau. Mm -hmm. We kind of a quantum leap from Isaac to Esau. Yeah. Esau, he's 40 years old. See, remember, Isaac was 40 years old when he got yeah. married to Rebekah. Esau was 40 years old when he took a wife, took to wife Judith, the daughter of Beer, Be Beri, the Hittite, and Bashamath, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. Now, there's something to be seen here. Esau didn't have a godly character. He, in fact, he was called profane. That's how the 
Holy Spirit called him profane. I draw a little parallel between Isaac and Esau here. Isaac's the promised heir. Esau would be ruled over. Isaac was accepted. Esau rejected. Isaac was Abraham's heir. Esau is not Abraham's heir. Isaac lived in Canaan. Esau didn't live in Canaan. Isaac is blessed of God. Esau did not receive the blessing. Isaac married Rebekah at 40. Esau marries Hittite women at 40. God appeared to Isaac. He didn't appear to Esau. Promises were made to Isaac. Promises were not made to Esau. God's the God of Isaac. He's nowhere called the God of Esau. Isaac is faithful to his wife. Esau is a fornicator. Isaac's the ancestor of a chosen race. Esau is the ancestor of a cursed race. See, I'm just, uh, yeah. I'm just showing you the difference here between these two men. So Esau chooses, chooses two Hittite wives. Yeah. Now, uh, Hebrews says he was a fornicator, a profane person, and fornicator. Esau took two Hittite wives to be his two Hittite women to be his wives and later he took another wife who was a daughter of Ishmael and after that he took wives of the daughters of the Cana of Canaan among whom was the daughter of a Hittite the granddaughter of a Hivite and another daughter of Ishmael fornicator just to confirm that he was what, what the scriptures say he was his descendants the Edomites were avowed enemies of Jacob's seed. The book of Obadiah, the prophecy, is against them because they yeah. cited against Israel, whom he says was your brother. Yeah. Cited against them. Now the man who sold Abraham a piece of property, remember the bearer's wife, he was a Hittite. Yeah. Probably the most famous Hittite was Bathsheba's husband was a Hittite. Uriah the Hittite. Yeah. <laughs> However, Esau had no inclination to the seed of Abraham. He just he felt free to just marry the Hittites. Mm -hmm. uh, but then this little sentence yeah. <laughs> closes out this chapter, which were a grief of mine to Isaac and to Rebekah. To, I, to Isaac, too. Mm -hmm. Remember, Esau's a son he loved, remember? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he couldn't abide his wives. Mm -hmm. he, loved, he loved Esau. He didn't love Esau's wives. Just because Esau was in good favor with his dad, there was no sign his wives were. They were not. The language indicates that the, it's just not that Esau married Hittite wives. The wives themselves caused grief, which meant they were, they were close at hand some way. Caused grief. They were a grief of mind. The New King James says, they brought grief, New American Standard. They were a source of grief, NIV. They made life better, New Revised Standard. So these wives complicated yeah. the lives of Isaac and Rebecca. These two women introduced bitterness, grief. Some of you have tasted of this kind of thing. Certain people have complicated your life. They, they brought, they introduced grief. You don't have to talk your way around this. This is just a fact of life. Some people cause grief to their own families. But see, this is noted. This is noted in Scripture. <laughs> it's noted in your case, too. Caused great grief of mind. I just depict Isaac and Rebecca every time they saw those Hittite women. They, I don't doubt they talked different and acted different. And they, they, they probably conducted themselves like a Hittite conducted himself. Right. It was a source of grief to them. See, the ungodly are an irritation to the godly. Doesn't make a difference who they are. So. Sometimes it's, uh, it gets pretty close to home. Doesn't make any difference. The ungodly are an irritation to the godly. See, as a person draws closer to God, closer to God, ungodly people become less and less tolerable. 
Doesn't mean you're mean, you try and be kind, but it's a grief. Yeah, that's right. It's a grief. Try and, try and handle your grief admirably so you're not wearing your feelings on your coat sleeve and things like this. You try and conduct yourself so that you don't draw undue attention to your grief, but you know and you know that they've caused grief. The man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of the scornful is not considered to be an intolerant man. God doesn't say, look, you've got to do a little bit more mingling with the people of the world. You want to reach people, you've got to become their friend. And this is what men say. This is, God didn't say this anywhere. This is what men say. Now I think we ought to put their feet right down, right down in the fire, uh -huh. and say, "Support what you're saying with a thus saith the Lord," and we're not going to settle for one of your harebrained interpretations. Bell it out now. Where does it say that? Amen. Where does it suggest that? Jesus didn't say to us, "You disciples, stay here. I'm going to spend some time with the Pharisees. Someone's got to reach them." So I'm going to go over here and spend some time with the Pharisees, scribes. This isn't the way Jesus was. Without the way you can't see, you're not going to reach people for Christ by compromising. It just won't happen. The psalmist said, uh, let the wicked forsake his way, or Isaiah, let the wicked forsake his way. This is God's word. Let the wicked forsake his way. So when you're around the wicked, tell them that. You're an ambassador. You're an ambassador for Christ. Tell them, okay. you got to forsake your evil way. Most of them know they got evil ways. Tell them to forsake them. This is what God, this is what God says. Show them in the Bible. Make them read it. Here it is. Let the wicked forsake his way. There it is. And the unrighteous man is thoughts. man who does not walk uh, well a man here's how that psalmist prayed gather not my soul with sinners what he asked God don't I, I don't want to like be surrounded by sinners it would be alert so I, at least I'm not surrounded by them why are these things written this way because sinners and transgressors and the ungodly are a source of vexation to the godly they're a source of grief you don't want to beat yourself up by choosing companions that cause grief. You're just you're administering unnecessary pain to yourself. Amen. Godly character doesn't abide sin, see? It's a clash of natures. You take the godly, they have a different nature. And the ungodly, they they clash. There's no neutrality here. There's no neutrality at all. A clash. Friction is caused. Outwardly, they are all members of the human race, but within, one's governed by one spirit and another by another spirit. Yeah, now, we know what it's like to be alienated from God because we were once in that state ourselves, see? Right. So we, we understand. We understand what about people that are not in Christ we, because that's who we were. We understand. Listen how it says what we were, what we were. We were enemies. We were the servants of sin. We were carried away to false gods. We were dead in trespasses and sins. We walked according to the course of the world. We were without Christ. We were alien in the life of God. Our understanding was darkened. We were darkness. We were enemies in our mind by wicked works. We were without Christ. We were not a people. We not obtained mercy. We were sheep going astray. So, see, we're like experts yeah, that's right. Amen. in this kind of life. Uh -huh. It's not like we don't understand how people can live like that. We want to live that way. And we knew we had to get out of that life to get to make any kind of progress toward God. It, but see, if it didn't cause a grief of mind, yeah. you'd get sloppy. Mm -hmm. See, this is by divine arrangement. God intends for you to be uncomfortable when the ungodly are around you. He intends because that's one way you're protected. Mm -hmm. You're made alert. Uh-oh. <laughs> I'm finding that the waters are getting kind of yeah. agitated here. You can see what a stark contrast there is between what we once were and what we are now in Christ. Now those, yes? That's why it's important to try to, 
to, to be separate because the more you're mingled in, then you uh, start acting that way. And that's you start right. Thinking that's okay, and, and you just kind of slide back into that's that. That's right. There are those that teach that Christians are sinners like everybody else, but they're just forgiven. That, that's the only real difference. Aside from being forgiven, they're really like everybody else. Well, this, if that's the case, then we wouldn't have grief of mind. That's right. uh -huh. Then there wouldn't be hatred. Uh -huh. The world hates you. That wouldn't exist yeah. if we were really like everybody else. Yeah. Because, as Jesus said, the world would love its own. Mm -hmm. yes. yeah. So what Jesus said, the world will love its own, but they hate you. What he is saying was, you're really not like everybody else. Yeah. Right. And don't be ashamed to admit it. You can say I am what I am by the grace of God, but I'm not like that anymore. And I can't feel comfortable in the presence of people like that anymore. And if I am there of necessity, I'll be peaceable, I'll be kind, but I will not compromise. Well, I think we'll, uh, we'll close there. As I say, there's a listing in the back of all the firsts to this point. And then I inserted this special page in here about the trip of Brother Aaron and Brother Michael to Burkina Faso and the itinerary of their Faso. So you kind of know how to, how to pray about, about this, and I, I thought you might be interested in that. A lot of good things that we're praying will be accomplished. Any of you have a, any other word you'd like to add? Yes. You're speaking of this flash of nature's God, God's character can't abide and send the, that's when the ungodly are in irritation to us, that's a sign that we're on the right road. Mm -hmm. Because God can't tolerate sin, and if we're, we too can't and are irritated by it, then that's a confirmation to us. Yeah. God is in our person. Amen. Yeah. And you, I know that in this matter, some of your biggest battles will be fought when you're by yourself. Yeah. And you you want to be able to fight the good fight of faith when, like, you're by yourself, mm -hmm. badly, maybe with the sin that so easily besets you. <laughs> And, and let, let this grief and conflict of natures determine how you fight. When something begins to interfere with your life with Christ, no matter how small it may appear, that it's a warning signal. Be alert now and, and to arms. <laughs> Anyone else tonight? Yes? I was also thinking along those lines. The more that you are with the world, the farther away you are from God, and the more comfortable you are with the world. Yes. And so, the closer you are to God, the more irritation you will feel against you and a non-believer. Amen. That's good, Sister Moran. It's absolutely the truth. See, and that's part of working out your own salvation. Is you, you per this is something we, no other person can settle these things for you. You have to work this out yourself, and every person's situation may differ. You may be a little different on the surface, but learn how to handle this kind of kind of grief. And yes, Sister Logan. With this clash of godly against ungodly people, it makes you all the more thankful for that God puts us around people of like precious faith oh, amen. and the brethren, because they're who encourage you and keep that hope alive of the fellowship we'll have in, to come in glory mm -hmm. and it encourages you so that you're strengthened to go out and face the ungodly Amen. and be able to stand. Yes, Sister Maddie? Earlier you were speaking of uh, the, this great feast that God sets before us and, uh, and the contrast between what the Babylonian church presents before its patrons and one of the the greatest dangers of not providing all that God has made available is that you're not satisfied 
Yeah. They don't have the satisfaction of being filled. And so it leaves this want for something else. And the only other thing available is what the world offers. That's right. So you end up That's uh, right. filling up on things that are really like poison rather than food. Yes, amen. Go ahead, Sister Eddie. Uh, little samples instead of a piece. I thought of if you just give a sample of the truth, the whole thing would just be a, um, a lie, just like the devil does. He just gives a sample of the truth, so it will look like the truth, and it's really just a lie. Mm -hmm. Yes, amen. Little lady. Yes. Yeah, I'm talking about uh, the United States. I find myself more more aggravated with with those that are worldly that call themselves oh, believers than I do with those that. I, I know. I know it's exactly they don't what's call in themselves it. Anything and they don't, yeah. they don't think it. I, I find myself being more irritated oh, yeah. than, than the world the itself. Way, Jesus was the same way, Brother Levine. Yeah. And it, actually, this is in, this is parallel because they were in the same land. Yeah. Uh -huh. But the Philist, they were in the same land. But they, uh -huh. yes, I do, I do know what you mean. And Jesus, they, he was that way. You know, uh -huh. when he was around the Pharisees, it was a lot different than if it was around disciples, maybe, that weren't up to speed, you know. Yes, that, that's true. And that is is because the, it's worse. It's a worse sin to represent yourself as being close to God when in, you're actually at a distance from him. That's a worse transgression than some of these other things, yes. Yes, Sister Melissa. Beginning when you was talking about the Lord appeared uh, unto Isaac the same night. It says, And the Lord appeared unto him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham thy father. Fear not, for I am with thee and will bless thee and multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. And he built an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there. And it just reminded me of how whenever, um, it's really a personal thing, but whenever you call upon the Lord, he will appear to you then whenever you're really seeking him. Yeah. And you pitch your tent there. Amen. And, uh, and Amen. call upon him, then he'll appear to you. Amen. You don't want to leave the place where the Lord's appearing to you. Amen. 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 Did you going to say something else? Well, I thought you were going to say something else, but other mm -hmm. Anyone else? All right, we'll have a word of prayer.